It, so we it should looks be live. Good. It says live at the bottom. Okay. So. Oh, hey, everybody. Oh, nice. We're live. Hey, guys. Hello, viewers. Oh, yeah, look. We're live. Hey. If I can... I have the YouTube thing pulled up. And right now... Um, oh, here we go. It's getting to say live. Yeah, there'll be a little bit there'll of be a little lag. lag, right? Yeah. Yeah, there'll be a, exactly. There's gonna be a lag between what you can see and what you can hear. So if you're watching both, it's gonna get pretty confusing. Yeah. I <laughs> muted the YouTube one. Yeah, me too. <laughs> that was good. Um, so if you wanna start, uh, we can introduce ourselves. Uh, I'll start on the bottom of the screen, I'll go across. So if Ashley, you're on the furthest side, so okay. if you wanna start so with your introduction. First? Yep. Sure. Hey, I'm Ashley Ness. Ashley, Ashley Ness, whatever you want to call me. I am an audio engineer, singer-songwriter, and, yeah, friend of the arts. I like music and art and all kinds of fun things, and science, of course. Um, yeah, I've been, I guess that's the important stuff. Hmm. Um, I've been doing audio, audio for, like, eight years now, I guess. And I, uh, right now I edit audio books, and I do the singer-songwriter thing whenever I have time to do that. So, And that, now I'm in YouTube. So... Yeah, all kinds of things. My channel is um, Ashley Ness Vlogs, and I'm doing um, music reviews and a lot of just all different things about music. Hopefully, I'm going to merge into education and um, help people like discover things that they haven't really been able to, you know, thought of looking at or, you know, different kinds of music that they probably would like but don't know that exists yet. I guess. So that's it. <laughs> And I think, Matt, you're next on my screen if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah, cool. So my name's Matt. I have a YouTube channel called Conjecture. Um, I basically... So I'm, I'm kind of young. I'm 19. Um, but I basically just started taking ideas that I thought were really cool and I was, were ideas I was passionate about. And I realized that, you know, oh, maybe I could do something with YouTube. Maybe I could share these and craft videos. Um, and just share the things I love. So that was that. Um, now I'm sharing the ideas I love. A lot of them focus on psychology or education. Um, and I'm actually at Penn State right now in an education program that focuses on how designing learning environments can basically improve learning or make it more individualized. Um, so I'm kind of interested, at least right now, in <coughs> creating an environment where students could discover their passion, or, yeah, discover their passion and work towards it. Um, Megan, do you want to go next? Am I next on your screen? Yeah. Okay. Um, sure, yeah. Uh, so my name is Meg Gilbert, and uh, my channel is Meg Motherwort, which is also my Twitter. And most of the stuff I do on my channel is for the art assignment, um, but I also did some vlogs and social commentary and some other little odds and ends and things like that. And my background, uh, I have a PhD in educational psychology, and I taught psychology for a couple of years, and I was a professional statistician and research director and stuff like that for a while, and now I take care of Lily full-time, and she is my two-year-old daughter, who I'm sure at some point you will hear her screaming at me in the background. <laughs> Thanks. And uh, Peter, you're next. All right. Hey, everybody. I'm Peter. Uh, I do go over banana, and then I have a vlog, but we don't speak of the vlog. Uh, <laughs> on, <laughs> on go over banana, and basically what I did was I traveled around the world for about four months, and I met up with educational YouTubers. It was really cool. Uh, in fact, Meg person right there on my screen, uh, I interviewed her, one of the first people for my project, and then I've, I've interviewed Hank Green, basically everybody at DFTBA, uh, a bunch of people that do PBS Digital Studios, a few people across Europe that I still have to upload the, the interviews with, my Grugnetta, all those folks, and that was all because I wanted to figure out what I want to do with my life after I got out of the Navy, which happened uh, just a little over a year ago. Uh, and so now I'm kind of rebuilding my savings, uh, uploading the videos, and trying to figure out which grad school and which grad school program I want to do, because it's free, so might as well use it. That's really cool that you were in the Navy. I had no idea. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was in the Navy. I was a Chinese and Spanish interpreter. 
So, oh, and by the way, I speak three languages. So. I was about to say, that was my follow-up question for being, oh, wow, you probably know some of those languages you interpret for. A couple, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then, Tim, uh, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself or you're still uh, busy with the robot stuff. Or I can introduce Tim <laughs> for him. So, uh, Tim and I run SciJoy. Um, my name is Jacqueline. We were both on a robotics team down in Maryland. We actually worked for the Navy, too, but as civilians. For NAVAIR, as engineer, engineers, um, we're both aerospace engineers. Uh, Penn, uh, Tim went to Penn State, actually, and I went to school down at Embry-Riddle. And we both really think science outreach is important, and we wanted to start a channel where you could do more hands-on science, because that's where we kind of think you learn the most. It's not really a spectator sport. You should actually go in there and kind of get your hands dirty with science and do experiments and stuff like that. So, um, just follow-up questions for some of you. Ashley, I saw on Twitter, did you do an audio book, book for um, ASAP Science? I did. Um, I work for a company called Common Mode, and uh, we edit a lot of audio books, and um, I work, I'm one of the managers for our Simon Schuster titles, and um, I was actually able to request the ASAP Science book, and I got to edit the whole thing, and um, I met the guys a couple days ago at um, Word Books in Jersey City. That's pretty Very cool. cool. Yeah, it was really fun. <laughs> oh, and for uh, everybody watching, just to let you know, there should be a little thing at the bottom that says join the conversation. If you click on that, you can ask us questions, and we'll see it pop up over here. Or we all have our Twitter handles um, under our names if you want to tweet us any questions that you guys have. Is that oh, in the Jackie, is that in the comment section link to video to comment on? Um, I think it should say like on the actual thing, it should say join this, join the conversation, and you click on it, and it takes you to like a new window. We can also pull up the video if people are commenting below it. Hmm. Yeah. Contact us in some way and we'll probably get to you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we'll answer your questions. Um, How did you guys do the magic thing with your name and the, the Twitter handle? Because I <laughs> am not a wizard. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you got it. So on the left-hand side... If you put your cursor over there, all these boxes are going to come up. And one of them is a little like red box with some tools in it. It's the Google oh, Hangout Toolbox. You click I on see. that, and you install it. Gotcha. So that's, that's how we do magic. Oh, you guys. <laughs> oh, OK. So a question did come up from somebody. They said, how is every, everyone doing tonight? Huh. From Arthro Knowledgery, I think it is. Oh, that's someone who saw this on my channel. I think. I don't see it in the comments, but yeah, I think it might be Anthronology. Anthronology, yeah. yeah. I think he does stuff with anthropology. Um, well, I, I don't know about you all, but I'm, I'm having a good night. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah. It's snowing in New Jersey, so. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. it's been snowing all day here, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is everyone here from, it seems like, I know Jack and I are in Pennsylvania. Where is everyone else from? I'm in, um, I'm in, I work in East Hanover, so that's where I am now, and I live in Harrison, New Jersey. So, real close to New York. California in May too. It's lovely here, by the way. I uh, I know that your guys' weather has been just the worst recently, and we have not gotten any of that. So oh. sorry. Our weather never changes. Yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little jealous of that, but you know, <laughs> I do all right in the snow most of the time. That's good. I was a little disappointed. You know, I spent the past. Uh, Four and a half years while I was in the Navy, I was in Hawaii, and I was looking so forward to like coming home during the winter and just being like, "Oh, it's a winter wonderland," because I live up in the mountains. And it was like, "No, it's 70 degrees and the birds are singing, and this is just the worst." So, I mean, 
<laughs> don't get me wrong. I'm glad I don't. I'm not in your guys' position, but still. Whew. We lived in Denver three years before we moved here, and I am now done with snow. That's that's about all I'm interested in experiencing. Okay. <laughs> Understand. <laughs> All right. Well, I think. Yeah. oh, go ahead. Okay, I was gonna, I was gonna say if, uh, if you would like to lead us off into talking about some of the things we all do and some of the questions, I guess we all yeah. ponder. So, how do you guys think that YouTube has changed education, either science, art, or just in general? Because I know each of us kind of touched on how we're trying to use it as a means for outreach or educating others, whether it's music or science. Well, uh, I would say, yeah, go for it. What, Peter, did you just cut yourself off? I, th I think I might have. <laughs> Do you want to answer it? <laughs> yeah, you seem like, I don't know. <laughs> you seem like you were going somewhere. <laughs> oh, sorry, I accidentally, so I got really confused for a second, because I just pulled up the YouTube video. Oh. on my other screen, and then I got the audio delay, and I was like, wait, wait, what's happening? But now I realize that I should pause that. Okay, so yeah, I think one of the coolest things about, you know, <laughs> I know, the internet and education is suddenly, we, so around the world we have all of these crazy people, crazy good, uh, that are like super smart and super passionate about what they do, and with a decent internet connection they can go on and they can do stuff like this. You know, whether it's Matt, who's over at UPenn studying education, or Meg, who's got her PhD in it. By the way. Oh, whatever. Potato, potato. Mm, uh, <laughs> potato, potato. <laughs> but you get my point. Like, yeah, yeah. you know, if somebody cares, and they have an internet access, and the know-how, they can go and share that, that passion that they have with everyone else, and I think that's awesome. So, I have a, a little bit different perspective than Peter. Am I interrupting somebody? No, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I, I agree with what you're saying, but I also think that sometimes the leaders in a field are not the ones who are the most charismatic or the best at explainers or, you know, some of these other things that actually make it um, more accessible for other people to learn something, especially something difficult. So actually there's been some interesting research that shows learners that are kind of at the beginning stages of learning something have an easier time with somebody who has learned that thing more recently than somebody who's like this, you know, lifelong expert at it or has been an expert at it for many years. So um, I think that has a lot to offer in YouTube is like, hey, I just learned how to do this thing and I wanted to share it with the rest of you. So here it is. So I think that that's um, increasing accessibility, which is really powerful. Yeah, Meg, to go off your point, so um, I, I don't know if you all have heard of this person named Eric Mazur, but he was a Harvard professor who, in 1991, uh, realized, the exact, realized the exact same thing, in that he taught a physics class at Harvard, and he realized that his he wasn't able to help the students who weren't understanding the material, because he, he just couldn't understand why they couldn't understand, because he's, you know, tenured professor, obviously PhD, things like that, new physics, up and down his alley. Um, and so he basically started, but he realized that even though he couldn't do it, other peers who had just learned it could. So he, instead of, you know, typical learning class, do homework when you go back, right, he had students read the textbook at night, do all the learning beforehand, and then, you know, your knowledge probably won't be totally solidified by the next day, but the next day you just spend working on the problems with your peers. And that was done in 1991, uh, and it's called flipped learning. And it's basically the idea that instead of learning in class, doing work at home, you learn at home so you can do work at class with your peers and try to fill in the gaps in your knowledge there. Um, and actually, I'm going to this thing at Penn State called the Teaching and Learning with Technology Symposium. Um, it's an event just being offered from 7.30 to 4. Um, and actually, Eric Mazur is the keynote speaker, which is oh, crazy cool. coincidental. I think that's what Khan Academy's main goal is, right? To flip the classroom so you can learn anything you want at your own pace at home, and then they want to do more one-on-one um, -on -one learning within the classroom, right? Yeah, I don't know how much of Khan Academy actually is done at home, but they have a super cool interface because 
they, because, you know, everyone's working with the same exact interface, so if students are doing a problem, teachers can pull up that interface and look at which individual student is struggling on which individual problem, so the teacher can walk over to that student and before even saying anything, knowing, know, before even saying anything, know exactly what the student is struggling with. Yeah, one of the things I really liked about Khan Academy, do, is everyone familiar with what Khan Academy is? Sort of. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's um, all their videos online, and it's pretty much any subject you can you can watch. But what he started was his niece was having trouble, and it was just she didn't get it that day. And if you were ever sick in a classroom and you missed that one lecture that one day, especially in something like math, you kind of you just have this gap, and it keeps growing and growing as you go on. So it's, that's why I like Khan Academy and other online resources. Is it's always at your fingertips whenever you need it. Somebody kind of there, a group of people that you can um, tap into instead of just listening to that one lesson and hoping you get it and you're not distracted. Yeah, and one of the cool things that Khan Academy has been doing, uh, kind of to write off what Matt was talking about, how uh, like you do have those people who do it at home, but then there are also the people who do it at school. So Khan Academy, I think, recognizes that they have a lot of people who do Khan Academy at school under the supervision of teachers. And so this, I think it was January, they started this thing called LearnStorm which is basically a, uh, a competition amongst a bunch of schools around like the US and I guess the world where you know whatever class gets the most time in and the most number of problems solved you know it's, it's just a fun sporty game of competition uh, but they did this thing where because uh, I get emails from them for every little thing uh, if your school has so this email says a majority of your school students are in the free and reduced lunch school program uh, and a few other things, and the school will unlock free devices and home internet access for students, uh, which I think is really cool that, you know, they have that, that self-awareness that, you know, although it's, you know, it's great that they, that the students may have access at the school, uh, a lot of the learning can be done at home, and there, there are certain things that they can do to enable that better. So, I thought that was pretty sweet. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of our questions from Twitter, let me pull up to read it, was they are interested to know what we would think one of our favorite or greatest accomplishments are for spreading our message, whether it's, I guess, science, education, music. So what do you think your greatest or favorite accomplishment is? Up for anybody. Um, okay, I'll kick this one off. So, I actually just talked about this in... Oh, super quick tangent. Is anyone here going to VidCon? Yes. Yep, I'll be there. Nice, nice. Okay, so am I. Yep. Um, so, I don't know if you saw, but they did this thing called the Less Than Famous panel. Mm -hmm. um, well, they are doing it, rather. Um, and they held auditions for submitting a video to be in that. And it's just, you know, for people who are, as the humbling name implies, uh, less than famous. So just talking about what YouTube means to you being a small YouTuber. And so I actually just put this in, I created the video yesterday because yesterday was the deadline, and I actually just put this in the video. So there is a video on my channel called YouTube for Schools, and I think I put it up in late December or early January. And I basically talked about how, why I think YouTube shouldn't be banned at schools, because it was banned at my high school. Why it shouldn't be banned at schools, and then the fact that there's actually a program called YouTube for Schools that Google created in December 2012, which takes out um, comments, comments related videos, and also all the videos um, in it are sort of a pre-created library of edu educational content um, deemed educational by YouTube. So there's really no good reason not to do it. Um, and basically, at the end of the video, I said, um, hey, you know, if you are in a school where this is banned, show this to a teacher, a superintendent, whomever you can. Um, and, you know, even if they want to, they can contact me. I would just love to see this happen in more schools. And this one guy comments at the video, oh, I didn't know this thing existed. And then a couple hours later, he comments, or not a couple hours, a couple days later, he comments, um, I showed this to someone at my school, and YouTube is now in the process of not, or of being unbanned, so you have one success story. And reading that was so cool, because, I don't know, it's, I mean, it's always nice to have those calls to action at the end, right? But then when someone actually does it and the thing you wanted to see happen happens is really, really cool. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I saw that video that you did, um, and I, I was like, no, why can't I be in school still and show this to, the, to my teachers? This isn't fair. Uh, but now that I'm back home. Yeah. 
Yeah, I could. I could. I might. I mean, now that I'm back where I grew up, you know, I just popped down to the high school with my full-on beard so that they get really suspicious. Like, what is this bizarre 28-year-old doing? But I assume my teachers will remember me. Um, no, I don't know. But uh, since I'm talking already, uh, since so I guess one of the things I'm most proud of is actually completing my road trip um, and not breaking the budget and being able to put the videos out and like being able to talk to as many people as I was. And then actually having people, like most of you guys actually, let's, let's be honest, uh, come <laughs> and watch my channel yes. and like actively participate in the process of discussing what I've been doing. It's like I feel vindicated. Vindicated isn't the right word. Maybe it is. Yeah. But like that I put forth all of this effort and people are getting stuff out of it. Like, well, uh, it's the best thing. <laughs> well, so. Peter, your um, your interview with Emily, mm -hmm. um, is what inspired me to kind of get this channel moving a little bit more. Like, um, I think it was about oh her job as a um, curiosity correspondent and um at the uh, Field Museum, and I've been wanting to do, you know, I'm wanting to make videos. I've been watching all like SciShow and. Um, all those, all the DFTBA stuff, and um, like, but I didn't know how to incorporate the educational component. And I, so, mm -hmm. um, but then I, you know, I, I watched that video, and I, and you, your question, what was, um, what was the question, Peter? Do you remember? Uh, <laughs> what, uh, what are other museum could, uh, or what oh, other yeah. like, mm -hmm. place could use like a um, curiosity correspondent? And I was like. Maybe the Met, or like, but then you know that just kind of that whole thing just yeah. got my got my brain going, and yeah, oh, I, got I so actually excited. have like a direction for what? I got so excited when you emailed me that you're like, hey Peter, I was watching your video, and uh, <laughs> you know I got really excited, and I was thinking, you know, I should do this, I should become the chief curiosity correspondent for the Met, and I was like, what? An excuse <laughs> to go back to New York? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, I haven't been in touch with them, but uh, but yeah, the whole idea of um, trying to expose people to different kinds of music and um, one of my ideas was I had I think I listed like two or three video ideas in that comment for that video, but um, just like different ways of exploring how things are connected. Like um, one of them was uh, the history, kind of the history of vocal music and. But which could like be a whole series. I'm like the whole thing is just is still an idea and a work in progress. But it was really cool to um, just kind of get that going in in my head. And now I'm like connecting with people, and you guys invited me to this, so I'm very thankful for that. <laughs> it's really cool to be talking to you. And yeah, I guess that's it. Yeah. I'm excited and looking forward to making more videos and music and stuff. Woo. I think that's one thing that people don't really realize about YouTube. My favorite has always been like interactions like this. I met you all in very different um, things. I met Ashley at the SciShow meetup up in New York. Yes. Um, Matt was through the Nerdfighter online video workshop. Uh, I saw your, your video on that. I think, Meg, I don't remember which of the many things. Like We did Project for Awesome and Art Assignment and so many different things that that's how I met you and talked back and forth on Twitter. And um, Peter was, I think, you through Betty's Twitter. And Betty's yeah. not here. She's in China. She did leave a video and put a link um, below in the Hangout. But I met her when we went, Tim and I went down to Huntsville, Alabama, for that uh, thing Dustin put on. So it was just talking with people and building a community. And I think my favorite thing to get my message across was during the Nerdfighter online video workshop, uh, we exchanged scripts and stuff. And there was a teacher in Thailand that actually saw our, it's called Unfolding Atoms. And it tells you how many times you fold a piece of paper to get to the moon. I don't know if you guys have heard about that before. It's like 42 times. But I wondered if you folded it so many times, which is impossible, but is there enough material even in the paper if you stacked like the atoms on top of each other? And I made like a whole video for that, and he showed it to his class, and they were so excited that they started making their own experiments like in the classroom, which to me is the ultimate goal of any videos that I make, is that it actually works in the classroom. 
and I've had some of our robotics students tell me that they've gone home, watched the videos, and asked their parents for like cornstarch and water and things to start doing the experiments. So to That's me, cool. people actually going out and doing doing the things we're talking about in the videos is definitely the, the best thing that could happen. Yeah, that's similar to my YouTube thing. Or my nice. video, I guess. Nice. Um, kind of. we have... Oh, what? Oh, I was just going to say, funny, total tangent. Um, speaking of videos being used in a classroom, so that, that vlog that we don't speak of, I had it back in 2007, <laughs> and I made a video about 4th of July, and this random teacher from, like, Chile left this comment. He was like, Hey, yeah, I'm I'm using this video to like show to my students in Chile what like the Fourth of July in the U.S. is like. And I remember back then being like, Yeah, I'm educating people who aren't from this country about my my traditions. <laughs> that video is hidden, by the way. You're never gonna find it because it's ridiculous. <laughs> Everything before 2008, but I'll tell um, you about it. Yeah, we have a question in uh, the Q and A from. The Darth Melon. <coughs> uh, what advice would you give to someone wanting to start a YouTube channel sharing science and education in fun and interesting ways? Just do it. <laughs> I think that's the advice that I've been getting. Just like grab your phone and start making videos. Um, I don't know. I think maybe one of you guys can speak to the actual science things better. But yeah, I think just actually, you know, making things is is the best place to start and um, and for me like I'm still kind of finding my voice in the videos and I think that is um, that's the that might be one of the hardest things to do is just to like feel like you're comfortable in your own um, you know the way you're presenting yourself to people so and, but getting started and um, being able to get any kind of feedback from people is great so that's and I think maybe trying different things, like being willing to try different media, like, uh, you know, maybe try drawing something or try something else, like to convey it in different ways, like don't feel like you have to commit to a consistent style when you're first starting out, because I, I when I first started, I found that to be too limiting when I took that perspective. So once I sort of freed myself into dabbling into different things, then I was able to think outside the box and bring a little bit more variety. I would say work with people, work with not necessarily like, uh, like-minded individuals, but with people. Um, for me, <laughs> like... Not robots, people. I mean, robots too, if you can get them to like... <laughs> we have give one you positive the yeah. yeah, like if you can set up a Python script to like every five minutes send you a like, good job, you're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, like, <laughs> uh, everybody that I've talked to, wait, let me double check. Yeah, everybody that I've talked to, it's never been just like a one-person show. Um, all of the folks at DFTBA have all of the other folks at DFTBA. Um, you know, I have all of you guys, uh, and Lindsay always hits me up and she's like, Peter, let me help you. I want to help you. I'm like, okay, Lindsay, help me. And, but like, having having that that support is really, really important, I think, um, besides and just... And bouncing ideas off of each other, too, because yeah. then you're not in a vacuum, right? Mm-hmm, exactly, yeah, because, I mean, what if you what if you come up with an idea, and it sounds great, but then you try and put it down on paper, and in your brain it makes perfect sense, but then you realize that, oops, I don't think like other people. So having that sounding board is very helpful. That's probably pretty important for education videos too. At least I've I've seen because if you're trying to explain something complex, you think it sounds perfectly fine. Yeah. But then ask other people like, did this? Did you actually understand this? Was this too fast? Too detailed? Too high level? Was it boring? That's at least in my experience. That's I usually send it to a couple people first mm -hmm. and say, what do you what do you think of this? Or I send a script out and I have people review it. Um. So in mine. I think I really just try. Okay, so if I'm not having fun when I'm filming the video, it's not going to be good. And I think that probably applies to the vast majority, if not all creators, really. Um, and there have been times, too, where <laughs> I, uh, I filmed a full video, or at least a lot of it, 
and then I sort of put it in Final Cut Pro, which I, I use, some people use iMovie or whatever else, and I'm looking over it, and I'm going, this is, this is, this is not, this is, this is not good. <laughs> um, and I tend to, I, that, uh, that has only happened something like twice, but I basically just scrapped those entirely. Um, and I honestly, I would just say, make sure you're having fun. Like, whether it's being really zany, or whether it's being, um, I don't know, really like Vsauce or something like that. And by that I mean just not more like educational and not as silly. That's what I mean by being like Vsauce. If you can make a video like Vsauce, then do that too. That'd be impressive. Um, but yeah, just I would say make sure you're having fun because even if you produce something that's educational, if you're not having fun, who are you really doing this for? That's a good point too is to like know what your own expectations are. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And I think don't scrap everything either because there are times where I want to like, you know, cut out half of the video and then wait, but I need, you know, I need the continuity. So mm -hmm. like be um oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um don't be too hard on yourself in, when you're getting started because you'll never get anything point. out and like <laughs> So, yeah. Oh, for sure. Because you, you're totally your own worst critic. This is this is yes. <laughs> absolutely the truth. Um, you know, be kind to yourself, which is just generally good good life right. advice. Right. Um, and have good expectations. And also, save bloopers. Don't delete them. Save them <laughs> for later. Because someday you're gonna need to have like an idea for a video, and you're just gonna be so wiped from like watching people who you adore talk about stuff. <laughs> that you just want to do like a blooper reel and give yourself a week break. <laughs> I tend to put some bloopers just I'm I'm editing a video right now that I'm hoping to get out on Monday and there are at least two three times in the video where I'm talking and saying something like oh and this happened because after the the after it and I just keep going. Yeah. <laughs> kind of like what you said I think Ashley just um yeah the only the only times I really deleted something that I worked on was cuz it was like legitimately bad even from everyone is a critic like you said. I think those times specifically like, significantly worse than the other things I've done. But, <laughs> but in general, yeah, yeah, I think it's really good to have that attitude of just, you know, it's not going to be perfect. Move forward with it anyway, because how else are you going to learn? Just as an example of that, um, for Pie Day, we want. I, I thought it would be funny to have a cow pie eating contest, <laughs> and my sister made cow puppets, and we have numbers over here that represent pie, and we tried to have two cows eat the number pie as a cow pie eating contest. Huh. That video turned out horribly, horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt bad because she spent all this time making the puppets. So if we can ever get it right, um, we'll put it out. But yeah, sometimes it's just it's too bad to put out there. But usually, um, you can, at least on my channel, I know, I can look through the beginning to now. It's been about like just over a year, and I can see that we got we got better over time. And it's definitely just start putting content out there uh, yeah. and, and see where it yeah. goes. And, and go find other people and talk to them in the comments, and that's it's part of the experience mm -hmm. to me, not just putting content out there, but trying to interact with, with other people and their content. Mm. Yeah, I just started my channel, like, I don't know, November, and I'm not even, um, it's really not even consistent yet, but I'm still finding either I'm learning something from every video or they're improving. Most of the time they're improving, and I'm, you know, <laughs> I find things <laughs> that uh, that I know that I want to make better for the next time. So, yeah, it's a, it's a learning process, I think. Uh, a good friend of mine said, if you can't find something that you could have improved in your video, then something's wrong. Either you become complacent or you're not looking hard enough. And I totally think that's true because, like you said, everyone's their own critic. And it doesn't even have to be something major, but even something minor. There's always a <laughs> lot of some things I can find with my video where I'm going, oh, I wish I had done that differently. So we have a. Um, I think it's important to just upload anyway, like, just so that you get it out there. You yeah. don't spend. <laughs> Yeah, you have to find like a nice balance between, you know, getting it to a point that you're comfortable with it and, you know, getting it out in a reasonable amount of time, you know, before it becomes irrelevant or before you like forget about it or hate it completely. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think Tim says the robot is working, so we can try that. But before we go over to that, 
some German dude in the question and answer asked um, <laughs> if, there was, <laughs> if there was a typo in Ashley's uh, Twitter handle. Oh, no. Is it a nine versus an eight? <laughs> oh, we also have more hey, questions what? inside, too. Yeah, there's a bunch of questions. Um, I figure we'll try and we'll attempt... Oh, there's a key. We'll attempt to um, start the robot off, and then we'll start answering questions as people drive it. So um, this, this is what you need to do. On Twitter, we tweeted out the video, uh, and also the first video on the SciJoy channel, if you're going to comment. And as a viewer, you can go. You can still watch this live stream. Don't, don't exit this live stream. But pull up a second tab with uh, the video that we tweeted out, and it's the first video on the SciJoy channel. And if you go in the comment section, you can type any sentence as long as it has the word left, right, forward, or reverse in it. And the robot should move around and draw. And Tim's been putting markers out. So he put it in the, in the lower third, too. Oh, I'd love to see to something you. creative. Like maybe someone writes a sentence like, "Did you leave? Did you leave the right monologue?" And you could say, "Yeah, I left the right forward." Or something like that. <laughs> yeah, you can. You guys can respond back and forth and start sentences. Um, so what <laughs> it does. It won't get as fast. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that's Tim talking. Hmm. You pick whatever color oh, you would like. Probably a darker color, I would imagine. I keep putting comments in the wrong video. My bad. <laughs> Maybe I'll close that window. Is it moving, Tim? I have red on it right now. Do we want to do blue? Uh, let's just see if it moves. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah. Can we just put the uh, ink on it and let it go? Yeah. All right. Because people are commenting. No, it's going to be... Oh, no, it's hard to get off. Because oh, my go. inbox is going crazy, so... I believe right. people are commenting. So what it does is it, it um, the robot pull we pull from the YouTube comments and it looks for the words left, right, forward, and reverse in a sentence. There you go, somebody started drawing. And it doesn't matter if you type left, right, reverse all in one, it's gonna see the first one of those and it will just use that. And it's gonna pull the comments every like two or three seconds and whatever you all voted is the top way for it to move, it will move. Oh, okay. I see. Awesome. I think we might have put the NXT on upside down. I don't remember. So forward may be the direction that the pen is on. All right. Cool. Should, be don't worry. That should be forward. Your commands are probably not going to be sorted by the order that they were received anyway. So. <laughs> hey, as long as it moves, we have success, yeah. right? And, and let me know when you want to do the color change. If we get advanced at this, it's good. It could probably what? take a while just to draw a circle. Yeah, I'm just hoping we we move some somewhat. I'm gonna take direction. this opportunity to get my computer charger. Okay. And we can put the code up for anybody that that wants it. <laughs> Purple. And all turns are about like I think they're close to like 70 or 80 degrees, so they're not fully right or left. That was the Darth Melon. That was your move. We got Z Stack trying to go forward. Hey, Zach. I don't think it likes to go forward today. What did you do? Yeah. We can uh, we can still answer questions as we attempt to get the robot to move, so people aren't just staring <laughs> yeah, at the robot yeah. and slowly moving. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Caitlin asked, "What is your favorite video that you've made, and why?" So, um, oh. do you wanna, Matt? Were you gonna say something? Or? I think he's doing power chord. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. I just um, put everything in. What did I miss? We were gonna answer a question. Um, favorite video you've ever made, right? Yep. And Tim, can um, you push the marker down? Because I don't think it's moving, but it's not drawing. Sorry, Matt. You can go ahead. Oh, favorite video I've made? It's drawing just hard. And by the way, if you want to go forward or reverse, make sure you type forward twice or reverse twice. It's just a bug. <laughs> okay, so my favorite video I've made? Um, I guess I kind of have two. So 
Um, I got a ton of exposure because I made a parody video of Vsauce, CGP Grey, and the Vlog Brothers, and um, obviously they're all educational YouTubers, so the parody video wasn't so much a parody making fun, right? It was just me explaining the history of parody and other things about parody in the style of those three. Um, so that got retweeted actually by John Green and Hank Green, which was super yeah. cool, and that's what really, really helped me grow um, out of this something like small hundreds range into around 2,000, which is where I am now, um, subscribers. Um, and I, I'm i glad <laughs> that, that got recognized because I spent, oh my god, CGP Grey definitely puts in a lot of work because I, I spent so much time on the CGP Grey part. Um, <laughs> so I guess I'm just trying to say that I'm glad it turned out well. I really like those three YouTubers, and they were some of the first three I ever knew, the first three educational ones I ever knew, and were part of my inspiration to begin vlogging. So I was really a fan, or well, I'm really glad that video turned out well, and I like it a lot. And then another quick one, there's actually a video on my channel called um, Is Trolling Creative? And that video didn't get much love, but I had a ton of fun with it because basically throughout a, something like a three minute video, I rickrolled the audience twice. <laughs> <laughs> so I really liked that video too. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, so that's me. <laughs> I actually, my favorite is um, the one I just made, um, I guess maybe three weeks ago. Uh, I did a review of the uh, uh, WNYC, the public radio in New York, has a um, Battle of the Boroughs. It's, nice. um, yeah, it's, it's really cool. It's, um, it's awesome. a Battle of the Bands, and they pick, you know, a bunch of um, different groups from all over the city. And uh, I went to the first show, and I think... Now I'm not remembering who it was, what, what borough it was, but, um, oh, Manhattan, um, I think, and, uh, yes, because my favorite, one of my favorite ones was from Harlem, I think, and, um, so I did a review of the show, and, um, the reason I liked that the best was it be was because I was, um, actually getting to talk about music and, like, some of the structure of the things that they were doing, and what I liked, or, like, actually felt confident as a reviewer, <laughs> so that was, you know, I had, I felt like I had relevant things to say, and that was something I hadn't really experimented with before, so, so yeah, it was fun. I have a playlist on my channel of about four or five videos I've made called Spirituality in Everyday Life, and they're all based on, I studied Shambhala Buddhism for two years, so they're all based on principles that I learned, but it's not really about that. It's more like, like in one of them I'm drawing mandalas and in another one um, I, I talk about like the meaning of the different colors of prayer flags and, and another one is like instructions on how to do a walking meditation in a labyrinth and um, so it's sort of like see themselves as Buddhists. Here are some cool things that might be interesting about um, some of these principles and so that is not one video, but it is one playlist, and those are my favorites. Thanks. Uh, so, I really, really, really like talking to Nick Jenkins, who does the directing for, or the producing. One of those. I always get them confused. Anyways, uh, for DFTBA, for Crash Course and SciShow and Sexplanations, uh, every now and then, the other stuff, um, Animal Wonders, as needed. Because uh, he's super smart, and he used to be a college professor, and he still, and he gave that up basically to do full time work for DFTBA. And this guy is so smart, and he's so great at what he does, and it shows in his videos. And like just getting to hear him talk was just one of the best things ever. Um, but then Jesse from Animal Wonders, my interview with her was by hands down the best because after it was done, we went and played with all of the animals, and I just died. <laughs> I literally yeah. died. <laughs> like, she had me hold a skunk and a boa constrictor <laughs> and foxes. I didn't hold the foxes, but I played with them, and they were so cute. <laughs> so, yeah. I think uh, mine was probably that Unfolding Adams one we were talking about. Um, probably my second is I made one that said, what is NASA for? Because I really love NASA and everything space-related. And I finally got to explain that it's more than just rocket ships. It's so much more than that. And it got retweet, retweeted and stuff some. So 
And I think that was probably my second favorite one that we've done. Hey, Jackie, uh, just watching here the feed. Uh, make sure you, so, uh, you lost the autofocus, so it's stuck on the robot. OK. Otherwise, you guys are talking in little squares. OK. Is that better? Tim? Go ahead and wait for it to show up on the live stream. OK. It's working on my end, so that's good. OK. Um, we have a bunch more questions I, on the side. How do you, how long did it take you guys to build a sizable audience? Oh, I don't know how big sizable is. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Fine, sizable. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm sit, I've been sitting at a comfortable like 700 for two months now, and I'm. I'm okay with that. Um, Although, to be fair, I got most of my subscribers, which one would expect, from after I did a video, uh, my Hank, my Hank interview. And mm -hmm. although I got more from Lindsay, I think. Um, although, fun metric, I've gotten more views over time, like consistently, from uh, Emily, Emily Eifler. No, Emily Grassley from the Field Museum. Like, people consistently watch her videos more often than any other video that I put out, which is really, really cool. And I get a lot of people from those. Yeah. Um, I actually, someone commented on a video of mine today, something like, oh, this is so great, you should have more views, which is really nice. Um, but, so I've thought about things like this before. Um, I'm, I'm starting to pick up, kind of like, I'm starting to pick up a little steam, because the one video I made went kind of big. Um, so, I'm, I've gotten something like, I mean, the numbers aren't important, but just to give you a, or, um, a, a metric, I think I got something like 300 videos in the past, or 300 subscribers in the past um, two weeks just from, and I actually didn't even upload a video in that time, so that was just, it's off and on. But I feel like two of the biggest things that I've taken away from doing YouTube for almost exactly a year now, um, so first, there's no telling what is going to make someone popular, right? That's just the way the internet works, right? The dress, Alex from Target, potato salad on Kickstarter. There's no way of knowing what's going to be popular on the internet. And you could be legitimately super good. You could have better content than someone like, I don't know, Vsauce or CGP Grey, the Vlogbrothers. You could have better content than them, but you still have to actually have the luck to be discovered, right? So if you don't, I mean, become amazing instantly, it's not that you're bad. I mean, you might be bad, but it's not guaranteed that. Um... <laughs> But the other thing I'd say I learned is that the one thing, so the first thing is luck, right? The second thing is the one of the two that you can control, which is just that just keep putting out quality videos. The more work you put into it and the more content you put out um, of, you know, an acceptable quality, that's the thing that really makes you grow, I've found. And I guess my f question to go along with that. Um, how do you guys interact with your your viewers or your YouTube community, whether it's a community you built with your channel or other communities you're in? I think because I know I asked this to to Peter in one of his videos and he talked about it, but I feel like sometimes educational videos are a little bit harder to feel like there's a real a real community around them. Maybe maybe that's wrong, but that's kind of my feeling. So what are your takes? Uh, well, I would say it really depends on how you define community. Like, some people would look at YouTube and they say, oh, the community is the people who view the videos. Uh, and sometimes, like, yes, that is part of it. And then some of it is, like, you know, the people who make videos, you know, the creators, as they call them. Uh, like, we ourselves, you know, there's a lot of overlap between those communities. Like, so I guess the way that mine... I interact with you guys through stuff like this, but like when you guys leave comments and you ask questions and you bring up great ideas, oh my god, that just makes me so happy. And like to me, that's that's the biggest community takeaway that I get is like you know, oh who was it? Was it was it you, Ashley? I think it might have been you who left like well, I mean email. You sent me emails, yeah. so that's awesome. I, sent, I left you a couple comments too, but what what specifically are you thinking of? <laughs> Well, somebody went through, and I think it was you, but I'm not positive, and left, like, these beautiful, well-thought comments on every single one of my videos, like, three pages long, and I was reading them, and I was like, yes, 
<laughs> this I don't think I write three page comments, but I, I, mean, I have commented on quite a few of your videos. Whoever that three pager um, person in is probably disappointed that you don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. Let me let me just pull They're up. They're watching right now. That was me. That was me. <laughs> They're tweeting you. Um, well, I could I could let's see. Um, but even besides that, like on Tumblr, you know, interactions when people ask me questions on that, like. Uh, stop talking to me. Sorry. Autoplay. Uh, <laughs> I got distracted. Um, just Tumblr. whenever Tumblr. anybody interacts with me because of what I've done, I consider them part of my community, and I think that's mm -hmm. that's the best thing. What was the question? Just um, <laughs> how do you interact with your, I guess, your community or your your viewers? Oh, it was more Brenda, by the way. Comments, Tumblr, Twitter, uh, email, apparently, in person sometimes, all that jazz. It's the best thing. Now Google, Google Hangouts. Google yeah. Hangouts, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so I have actually been thinking about this more because I've um, I had a little bit of a busyness in school right now, but for basically the rest of the semester, I'm devoting myself really entirely into YouTube, and I'm so excited about that. Um, but, so, I'm, I actually am literally planning on making a video in the next week or so. Um, so if any of my viewers here are, are here, you'll know this. Um, and I'm going to call it something like, help me help you. And I want to ask them, you know, what can we do, what can I do to get you more engaged. Because so first off, I try to respond to every comment I get, even if it's something like, Wow, nice video, I just respond, you know, thanks. Um, but I I feel like there's a lot more we can do. So, you know, with this robot drawing, you have examples like that. Um, I was gonna just make a video and say, you know, what are some things you think could be fun? Because we could do something like, I don't know, uh, Vlogbrothers do the question Tuesday. Wheezy Waiter has a thing where People just submit clips of them winking, and he puts them in at the end of his thing. Um, some people, you know, Q and A videos. Maybe if they want that, I could do that. Um, but I'm I'm planning on going to my audience and asking them, how do you think? What will make this experience more meaningful for you? I think that's really great, Matt, because I I feel like this is a little bit of a limitation in the YouTube interface. And while I enjoy doing all of those things that Peter mentioned, like you know, the Twitter and all those other ways to interact, and then you know, there's the comment section on each video. I, I feel like, and this is the case with YouTube, but then also in some ways how sort of the education model before all of this sort of technology changes started was, it's like a one-way street. Like information goes from the source of the information or the person who is doing the talking, and then is just sort of poured into the the recipients, <laughs> and then like I really like more more inter interaction than that. So I'd be I'd be curious to see what folks suggest to you. Oh Jacqueline, you're muted. <laughs> I think. All right, yep. back. Yeah. Hey. There we go. Thank you. So uh, another question. How do your friends and family react when they find out about your videos? I think my friends and family are the only ones who are like commenting on my videos. <laughs> <laughs> so they say nice things. <laughs> A lot of times my videos have my daughter in it, so hmm. people who like live far away and miss her will like, you know, be excited that they get to see her do something fun. Yeah, I think that was the first video I saw was your meet in the middle one, which was really, really cool. Yeah, before when you the, the question about having built an audience, like I like tent polling is kind of a thing on YouTube and I, I knew when the art assignment was going to begin because they had done some promotion and I just tuned in that day and I think I was probably the very first art assignment submission because I, I did it at home and it was one that was sort of implied that you would have to like go out and put some effort into it. And so that's was my biggest that's my biggest number of views is, is the meet in the middle for the art assignment. My family's been pretty supportive. 
uh, they know that, oh, Peter does a bunch of stuff on YouTube, and I guess, you know, that was what made him go around the world and be separated from us after he came home for, like, the first time in four and a half years, so whatever. Uh, but then some of my friends are nerd fighters, and so they're like, you interviewed Hank Green? And I'm like, no biggie. So... <laughs> Well, my ego's gotten a lot smaller since that happened, and they have gotten <laughs> really sick of it, so, you know, it works out. Um, my friend actually was the one who um, suggested that we do a Project for Awesome video, because I wasn't, I didn't know what to do, like, what charity to do, or anything, and then my friend Max was like, we need to do, you know, as soon as, as, soon as he started watching, um, like, Blog Brothers and that kind of stuff. He's like, we need to do a Project for Awesome video. And I'm like, okay, I guess we can do that. <laughs> um, and uh, and my sister is, like, one of my best critics, probably. Like, she gives really good constructive criticism. So that's that's a cool thing to have. She's also She also has a communications background. So, um, yeah, it's good to have her input on stuff. Yeah, my sister was the one that got me into this. Um, she was doing music videos for... Strawberry Seventeen. I don't know if you guys know that channel. When she was in high school, she's now a film major because of YouTube. Because she started cool. making videos on there, and she kind of got me involved in this. But most of my friends have no idea, like, much about YouTube. Like, my biggest way to connect with them is emailing and Facebook because they don't have YouTube accounts, any of them. So that's how they kind of all watch it. They're they're supportive, but they don't really. It's not really their world. Um, so for me, um, I mean, usually they just think it's pretty cool. The only person in my family who comments on the videos is my grandma, Mitzi, who may be watching this right now. I don't know. I hope she made it. I was getting <laughs> she commented on your video earlier. She said, study, study, study. That's the best Did, thing. Really? On which, on which one? I think so. I think she said, today's video you sent out, I thought she said, study, study, study. Oh, okay. I'm going to go check this right now. But anyway, so... Um, <laughs> But yeah, yeah, so most of my friends, I mean, they all think it's pretty cool. I think I do a, I think I do a good job of explaining it, but um, I don't know. For most, I mean, for a lot of people my age, and honestly I would assume every age really, um, they don't know much about YouTube, so hearing me tell them just what it's like, they all, they just think it's pretty cool, which is really nice. Somebody, did everyone get a chance to answer that? I oh, think. she did write study, study, I just pulled that up. <laughs> um, somebody asked us to show them a cool household science trick. One of the things we were going to do, possibly as a backup, uh, I know we're coming up on like an hour, but you can make homemade paper rockets pretty simply. Um, just need a, like a little body tube and a nose cone and some fins. And it's really simple to make a launcher. We, this is one of the favorite outreach activities we do with kids. We have like a bajillion kinds of duct tape in the background, but if you just take, it's like a half inch piece of PVC pipe, or you could roll up some paper that's like half an inch too, and you can make little paper rockets pretty easily. And if you use a two liter bottle and you stomp on it carefully, don't fall, um, you can get a, because uh, I've had kids fall, just like flatten their back, like oh. they get too excited, but oh, it's, uh, it's a pretty simple, pretty simple thing to do. So just take your PVC pipe and your bottle and put tape around it. How many, Tim, are you, are you on? Yeah, I'm on here. How many paper rockets do you think we've made in the past, like, year? Uh, in the past year, two? all. I don't know how many in the past year we've made, but over the years. <laughs> uh, I would say at least a few hundred. Well, we've helped a few hundred be made, all the kids we've had the uh, activities with. Which is like, it's pretty good for any age, so you just tape a piece of PVC pipe, a couple, it's a half inch in diameter, and then um, make a simple paper rocket. You put it on the top, and then hopefully this launches. Did you see it, or did it go Sweet. to Tim? Sweet! Yeah. So it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty simple process to do. Um, we did it on some of our other hangouts, and if somebody really wants the details, we can we can go through that. But I know we're coming up on like an hour, and there's some there are some more questions that people had. Um, High Wasted Pantaloons said, "I heard uh, everyone mentioned that they are going to VidCon. I am too. Um, they're going to be there for their first time 
and they've heard some scary stories, do you have any words of advice for newbies? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so first of all, just accept, last year was my first year. It was ridiculous. There were so many people, and I had such a great time, but seriously, there were lots of people, so just prepare for that. Um, when you go to VidCon, I would highly recommend going in a group or linking up with people who you trust, who you feel comfortable with before you get there. Um, before I went last year, I was a little nervous about some things, like, for other people's sake, like me, uh, I'm an adult, uh, and I've been adulting for a while now, and so I'm like, yeah, no biggie. Uh, so I put it out on Twitter, like, if anybody's at VidCon and they don't feel safe, you know, tweet me, let me know, I'll, I'll come find you, uh, and I'll hang out with you, or you can hang out with me, no biggie. Uh, of course, the caveat to that is I'm going to have an industry pass, so if I go into a panel like that, I might not be able to bring you in, but... Like, if you find yourself in a situation where you don't feel comfortable, let somebody, let the staff know, first of all. Uh, let me know if you just need somebody to hang out with. Uh, and hang out with people. And hydrate. Drink lots of water. Eat food. Don't forget to do the essentials. It may sound ridiculous, but I guarantee you that people will forget. Uh, so, yeah. Wear your most comfortable shoes, not your cutest shoes. Yeah, that's, true. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good life tip too. <laughs> You're gonna be walking more than three feet. <laughs> yeah. yep. Yep. I wasn't there last year, but I was year there the two years prior to that, and um, there was you're in lines a lot, either waiting for even waiting for panels. I'm I'm not talking about signatures. Even like I know the EGU EDU panel was the one I wanted to go to, and you had to sit outside of it for like a good half hour beforehand, and they even cut off people. So bring something that go with people so you can talk with them, but bring snacks and water and stuff in your backpack with you if you can, because it's a lot of it's sometimes going to be waiting around. And you can tweet at us if you want. Yeah, yeah we'll be yeah, there. All of us. Um, yeah, so. Yeah. It's actually my first. It'll be my first VidCon too. So mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. yeah, actually, it'll be you. It'll be our first VidCon. Um, and yeah, I guess also you can. I mean, I'm 19, so I guess some people would consider me adult and some wouldn't. But I'm also um, honestly, I'm either going by myself or with my mom because she wanted to go to California, so she might just go to this anyway. But mm -hmm. there's no problem with me going alone. She's just deciding if she wants to come with me or not. Um, so I am going alone, but. Um, I'm meeting up with, uh, well, you all first, but yes. also <laughs> with, um, also with my friend uh, Jack, who lives in Canada, and it's his first VidCon, and my friend Tim, who actually works for Hank Green in Montana. Oh, you know Tim? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, that's yeah, right. yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'll be meeting up with them. I'm pretty excited about that. Um, but yeah, you can also uh, tweet at me, and I'll be, I'm sure like everyone will be, you know, checking social media during that entire, mm -hmm. um, is it a, is it three days, that, is VidCon three days? Paul? It goes, uh, there's three? like, free gaming, I use the term loosely, Thursday, <laughs> and then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then, Sunday's yeah, the Disney and then Disney Day, day is it? usually the Monday afterwards, yeah, or is Sunday Disney Day? Monday yeah, Disney Sunday Day. Yeah, One of those day. is Disney Day. I think it's Sunday. It's so probably Sunday. the actual VidCon, Thursday, Friday, Saturday? I think, yeah, I think it's yes. Thursday. Yeah, <laughs> and it depends on what track you get to. I think industry starts a day before everyone else. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, that's my bad. Sorry, guys, I'm misleading you. Do you have an industry uh, this time, Peter? Yeah, I got it last time, and like, honestly, the biggest payoff of having the industry pass, like, and this was back when I had expendable money. Like now, I don't know if I could afford it, but back then I had different life priorities. Uh, but it paid for itself in that there's a different lounge. There is a lounge for people who do industry, and so like, because VidCon was crazy. I'm okay with people, but I, having that little space where I can go and be away from everyone without actually leaving the convention was totally, for me anyways, worth it. So. But this time they have there's three levels. There's community, which that way you can get stuff signed if you want. And then there's Creator, which mm -hmm. I'm doing. And That's that has its own too. lounge now. I'm doing that too. Yeah, it's, I heard that. So, that was too. so we yeah. can all hang out in the Creator's lounge. Rock on. <laughs> <laughs> huh. Yeah. So I've been cutting up pieces of rocket, by the way. Um, nice. To do the fins, just the edges of a, a sheet of paper is the easiest way to do it. 
um, three to four triangles. You can make it fancier if you want. Uh, the body is just, I would do like half a sheet of paper if you're going to do uh, a little rocket. And you roll it up and make sure it's about the same size as your launcher, wherever I put that. So make sure it fits on like your launcher. And then you put a piece of tape up the side. The big, the big thing about it is make sure there's no air coming out of it because it is an air rocket. And then the trickiest part of a rocket is if you cut out a circle and then cut a slit uh, from the edge to the middle, then you can take it and twist it around and you can make a nose to a cone. Well, that was and then sweet. You just, you just take that on top of... Uh, it's also a wizard's hat. <laughs> it is also a wizard's hat. And then just tape that on top and the trick to um, just blow in the air in the bottom and feel and see if any is coming out. And if it is, just put more duct tape on it. So Always put more duct tape. Yeah, always. So that's the easiest way to make uh, a simple air rocket for your science-y tricks. Nice. So what other questions? We have some German dude yelled purple. So that was good a question. question. Oh, yeah. good question. <laughs> good question. And then I think, um, I think that's most of them. Tim had a question in there. Yeah, yeah mine, was, mine was really, like, in-depth. Oh, okay. I don't know if you want to answer that. <laughs> Wait, well, actually, before we do that, I'm curious. I want to ask the rest of you, um, since you've all been to VidCon before. So, Peter, Tim told me he recommended having um, business cards or something like that with basically just your YouTube channel name on it. Yeah, I mean, if if that's something you want to do, for sure. Uh, it's a great way to network with people. I brought a notebook, and I actually have that notebook somewhere around here on my floor underneath my dirty clothes, uh, which actually came in a little bit really handy because like, I would meet up with a bunch of people, and yeah, I took a bunch of business cards, but it was easier for me just to write down people's contact information and then be the person who reached out to them. Um, it all depends on what your priorities are. So I like that, too, because not that there's anything wrong with business cards, but it has that connotation of, oh, hey, look, I'm networking. I don't actually care about you. Um, yeah. But uh, I like the notebook because that's you can also you know write down stuff about them. I'm gonna do yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, the I business cards are a really great idea. Don't get me wrong. Like, because uh, like I would get into big conversations with a bunch of people, and you know we get in dip, into depth, and, and I'd look at my clock and be like, oh shoot, I've got to run. Uh, but can I get your information? They'd be like, whatcha? Here you go. And they'd say, <laughs> So. Yeah, I, I think there's a thing for iPhones, if you both have iPhones, where it's like a, you do like a fist bump and it could trade your contact information and that's, yeah. you know, <laughs> fast and doesn't make Yeah, I, 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 rarely go, yeah. I rarely go anywhere without uh, a notebook and this is card. Notebook is more just for me, like if I have an idea or something to write down, but Peter's idea is good too. Yeah, notebooks are good. I actually do. We have SideJoy business cards that I take to that's because I go to the meetups sometimes in New York, mm -hmm. things like that. And it's really helpful, like you said, if you're going real fast and I can't get their information, I just tell them to contact me and I'll yeah. sub back or I'll tweet back or follow them or whatever. So if we can't exchange, and it kind of helps me too because we have that SideJoy logo and sometimes people are like, oh yeah, I kind of I kind of recognize that from comments in some video. Mm -hmm. So they have no idea who I am, but they kind of recognize the logo, sort of. So yeah. uh, I've found it useful in the past if you're talking to somebody. and Sometimes when I hand them that, then they tell me about their channel and I get to know more about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. Mm. That's a nice card you got there. Oh, ooh, the back. Explore. Fail, build. Make noise so we can see it big. I guess I could just click it, couldn't I? Yeah, I was about All to right. say that. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Sorry, I was not uh, It says, learning is more than understanding what others have done. It's, it's it is like realizing what you are capable of doing. Yes. That's deep, man. You took the words out of her mouth. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's kind of our, our motto. The only thing I would say with this one that I don't like is that there's absolutely nowhere to write anything because it's all black. It's true. Mm -hmm. it's, it's been a pain to do that. That's the only thing that's the only thing I do mm -hmm. with that. But they are pretty nice. And you always have like coupon codes on just print. Mm -hmm. Yeah. True. So mm -hmm. did you guys want to see what artwork you've created here? Oh heck yeah. Yeah, yeah. alright. I I'm okay. thinking a little on the abstract, kind of like a sundial theme, okay? And uh, hopefully hopefully we'll be able to go to see stuff. Let me get my non selfie cam going. 
Alright. I'm excited. Okay. If I can <laughs> do this right, I can see anything at all. It's like... Oh. Yeah, there we go. It's like a Pac-Man that exploded, I think. <laughs> it's like a keyhole for a very strange key. Can you yeah. want to tie it more, Tim? Or? It started up here. Oh, okay, you can see it. Okay. Look at all those lefts, initially. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. The camera's upside down and everything reversed on my screen. It's even worse. Yeah. They went around an arc. Each of them, there's one movement. Oh, sorry, guys. I'm getting nauseous here. All right, one movement, two movements, three. Uh, went forward. Somewhere. And I did another turn. Then I did that. And then a loop, oh. and then he came back. Yep. Kind of like, like a goldfish looking thing. Yeah. Yeah, I can't, I can't help but think of uh, <laughs> Zoolander, where he's like, <laughs> I'm not an ambi turner. I can only turn left. And then he turns three times to go right. <laughs> Oh my gosh! I wish. Do we have a video by any chance of the robot making that? Uh, it should be. It should be in the square. Or in the time that we were there. Oh, okay, cool. Somebody um, said it. It reminds them of the beginnings of a hankler fish. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> yeah. Our robot self self drawing. I think we're gonna make a Twitter feed for the next one. Uh, YouTube's really slow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so. And they're changing. One of our problems is they've been changing over like their API, so how it, it lets us call the comments has changed. So it's it's been slowing down. I think mm -hmm. the last question from that was on there was from Tim, and we can answer that and probably just wrap up. He says, "Do you think that we need more diversity in science, technology, education, and I would say art too, because we're talking about art, mm -hmm. more specifically addressing the fundamentals." that we can build and create experiments. It seems like there's a, a new app to fix. What did you say, Tim? Oh, it's so it like started that. cutting me off, so I had to, like, impress what I was saying. I was saying it seems like when you read about uh, science and technology and everything else, there's always some new app that's supposedly coming out, and it's the next great thing with education and technology. Um, but I think that the point of what I was asking is really, what are your thoughts on how we're kind of glossing over the fundamentals and as we're pushing people through the education system, not necessarily learning content, but you're just, you know, progressing them through so that they can graduate, move on to the next step, and the furnace is on. What are your thoughts? Huh. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think anyone who's saying such and such app is the next big thing is a marketing person, right? Yeah. I mean, that's their job. Mm -hmm. So. I, I agree with you completely. Yeah. I, I saw this thing on Tumblr, and I'm, I'm often very skeptical of things that I see on Tumblr, but this one thing that I saw was a really good point. It was, uh, like, if you're making something and it's not accessible to the poor who don't have access to it, it's not really that revolutionary. And I thought, like, right. that's a really good point. And that's, you know, and my, my follow-on Tumblr comment, feeling so self-righteous was like, libraries! And, <laughs> but like, I think that that is a big thing. If you want something to be like accessible and useful, you need to make sure that the people who normally wouldn't have access to it but need it the most have access to it. Um, and that was one of the, so Khan Academy, they have an app for iPhone, and I bet it's great. I wouldn't know though, because I don't have an iPhone, because iPhones are expensive. Uh, <laughs> They they have a, a video viewer for Android, but the one for the iPhone and the iPad, like you can actually go and do like the, the drawing and whatnot for calculations and jazz like that. So like that's my take. Mm -hmm. I think there could also be more diversity in like the leaders of those things. Right? Of like STEM. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. And I think kind of what you're saying with libraries, that's one of the things that Tim and I really like, is that it is getting out to more accessibility for people. Um, I know that you, you're starting to work with libraries now, and there's just more community building kind of things with like makerspaces and hackerspaces and libraries we just recently learned are more than 
just a place to go for books and you can get on a computer. There are, there are places that have 3D printers and, and classes and stuff now, which is pretty cool. And I think that is more more helpful than an app. It's a place to yeah. go and learn and build a community. Yeah. Um, Veritas team has a video called This Will Revolutionize Education. And it's a really great video. I'd recommend watching it. Yeah, Peter. Um, <laughs> he just talks about how, you know, um, I think, I think uh, Meg, you were saying this earlier, but people are, you know, people throughout centuries or history have been saying, oh, you know, this is the, this is the CD. This will revolutionize internet. Or, I mean, revolutionize education. I got ahead of myself. This is the internet. It'll revolutionize education. And while I would definitely say that the internet has made it, I would say the internet has revolutionized learning in our capacity to learn whatever we want. But I wouldn't say it's revolutionized education because, you know, even with the internet, what's happening in the classrooms right now is still basically what's hap what happened in classrooms in the 50s and stuff like that. And I think we need to see more things like what Eric Mazur of Flipped Learning did, what uh, Samuel Khan of Khan Academy did. I think we need to see um, less lecture-based stuff, or the, I would, teachers, I think, need to be less of an orator and more of a facilitator. Like, like you were saying in one of your latest videos that when you learned on your own, it, it worked a lot better than when somebody just said, you know, faxed you, which is kind of like what the back of our business card is trying to say, that they try and shove facts and things, but maybe you don't understand it when you're done. Like, if you can't apply what you learned to something new, then you didn't you didn't really learn it. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing is that I definitely learn best by sort of individual inquiry, inquiry, but, you know, so for some people, lectures work the best. Um, there's no there's no denying that. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think for a lot of people, too, it doesn't work. Yeah. Does anybody have... I think we're getting on like an hour and a half, so I don't want to keep you guys too long. Does anyone have any, like, final... I don't know what Tim has. Tim has... <laughs> what's going on? It looks like Tim has a scheme, is what he's got. <laughs> this will work. Come the end. This is our can. So, we've been promising this for a while, but we'll have this out later. Nice. Oh, it's uh, we're we're doing diet coke. You've seen diet coke and Mentos before. Mm -hmm. we, we're trying to do it with salt. Salt's actually better. Um, huh. Yeah. So we have filled. It's a three-inch diameter, and I think that one's like five feet tall. And we're trying oh, to please. fill it. But the problem is when you pour it out, all the carbonation goes away. So we actually have like a, a tank that will actually put CO2 back into it. So that's what we've been trying to work on. But we're also are trying smaller scale experiments because it varies with like temperature and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So that's that's what Tim was showing off. That was another fun at home science experiment you can do. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway. Do you guys have any final like comments or questions? Um, I can hang out in the comments of the video for a little while after we wrap up here to see what people are chatting about. I mean, if we still want to keep going, we can. I, it doesn't matter to me. I just didn't. <laughs> I didn't want to. Oh no, I meant like, like the text based. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But, yeah. I'm not in any terrible big rush to go anywhere. Well, I mean, I'm gonna go somewhere in like eventually, but I can stick around <laughs> for a little bit. So. I don't know about you guys. Yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not in a humongous rush. Rush. I don't really have anything else planned for the night. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we can stick around for a while. Um, does anyone? Oh, does anyone have more questions that you want to pose us, or you can tweet at us still? I don't know if anyone's tweeted at you guys. Uh, I got somebody who tweeted at me about uh. Just saying that Nick Jenkins needs to post more things to his vlog, which is absolutely true. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's if one you of my. Seen it, huh? Um, that Nick, your video, your interview with Nick is one of my favorite of yours too. He's, he's yeah. still, yeah. Yeah. He's so interesting. Um, he, he's so natural. Like, I mean, everybody's yeah. natural, but he right. really, the way he talks, you can tell that he's a teacher, and you can tell that he knows a lot about what he knows. Like. He's a subject matter expert, and it's just the coolest thing. So, 
What was you said he was a professor before? What was he a professor of? Uh, film cinematography. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he taught at University of uh, Montana in Missoula. So uh, he was doing that for a little while. In fact, so he and Lindsay both were professors at University of Montana before they started doing YouTube, mm -hmm. um, and then for whatever reason they both decided, you know, a stable income would be great, and so. Yeah, ended up doing the migration. Um, yeah. Hmm. You guys, what are some like maybe underrated YouTube channels that that you've watched? Just some channels, like That's hidden, a good question. Hidden gems. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a whole list. You know, I actually have a tool to answer this question in case you weren't aware. <laughs> There's this website, see, it's it's called mysterybox.govurbanown.com, shameless plug. <laughs> and it's got like 130 educational YouTube channels broken down by subject language and whether or not it has captioning. So I would say anything on that list, because I know the guy who went and made that list, he seems really smart. <laughs> I would trust his opinions on, on what's educational or not. I just actually posted that uh, link on Reddit like two days ago because somebody was trying to compile a list. I was like, there's already a list. It has way more than you have. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and uh, somebody it was somebody said, do you know any um, underrated YouTube education channels? I posted that. And like the fourth one down, somebody said conjecture, actually, on that feed. So Aww. people are putting you on Reddit. Aww. What, wait, what, um, what subreddit did you post it on? Uh, I think it was YouTube education videos. I don't know. I'm new to Reddit. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Reddit's weird. I mean, it's great. Yeah. But I don't. Yeah. Like, I'm just terrible at searching on Reddit, so I, mm -hmm. I can't find the things that I want to find. Well, yeah, I sort of was new to Reddit about a year and a half ago, so I consider myself sort of, I guess, a seasoned veteran of it now. <laughs> There's a lot of weird cultural things that you just understand from being on Reddit for a while, which, like, there are just tons and most of it is just tons and tons of memes that you pick up on yeah. from being in Reddit. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I've I've never really found searching to be that helpful. Usually, it, well, at least at the baseline search function, usually you just have to go look for a subreddit um, that's good or related to what you are looking for. But I found I found the actual search bar to be not helpful at all. I got bored, so I'm pulling up the list, and I'm like, who among these do I really like uh, that aren't well-known? I don't know about um, well-known, but um, Anthony, you know who I'm talking about, Peter, I think. Uh, yeah, 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 he and I are friends. He's, yes, absolutely. If you guys don't know who Anthony D'Angelo yet is, yes, thank you. Yeah. he is all about studying YouTube as a medium, and so yeah. the videos he put out are about YouTube as a culture um, and as a subject. Because he studies new media, and he's trying yeah. to make that into his his life, and he's doing a bang up job at it. Yeah, he's really. Uh, and he was, yeah, he was, he was on the panel last year, the the less than famous one. Oh. Um, yeah. So yeah. super smart, and I think his channel name is Lego Shark Productions. For Lego what reasons. Productions? Lego Shark Productions. Lego Shark. We all made mistakes back when we first started our channels. <laughs> we all made mistakes. <laughs> Lols. Um, I would have to say I'm gonna have to just plug the people in my featured creator section because <laughs> um, I don't know they're all they're all they're good friends of mine and I like their stuff. Um, so that's uh, Think Fact. The Think Fact. Uh, his name's Dale. He's a nice guy. Um, Jack Sai. Jack. He's my friend from Canada. I'll be meeting up at VidCon. And actually, I should check because I'm missing I'm missing that off memory. And then I actually have this other um, guy named Will on my channel. He doesn't do education, but um, the people on my channel are... Oh, also, also Plethrones is another educator on my channel who does animated videos. And he's really good. We're actually doing a collab soon. Um, but the people on my channel and the related thing are all bigger than me except Will. And I think I think Will's super funny. He doesn't, um, he doesn't do educational stuff, like I said, but he's super funny if you're just looking for a small YouTuber. Sweet. I'm gonna have to get the those guys from you later, and or send those yeah. to me, and then I'll yeah. add them to my database because yeah. that's how I do. 
They are also, I mean, I can send them to YouTube, but they're also in my YouTube featured thing on my channel page. Yeah, but I'm pretty lazy. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll look at that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can send them to you, too. No, 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 I'll, I'll, I just had to call myself out so that I, you know, I had to kick myself no, no, down. No, 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 I already screenshotted it. Oh, man. Making this too easy. Where's the fun? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, there is actually one channel, and I don't know if it's really educational, but it's sciencey as heck. Uh, it's called RHNB, uh, Red Hot Nickel Ball. And basically what this guy does is he takes a ball of nickel and superheats it until it's red hot glowing and drops it on things. It's, that sounds fun. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> like... Because, I mean, if you've ever wondered, like, oh, I wonder what it would be like if somebody took a red-hot nickel ball and, <laughs> I don't know, dropped it in a thing of gasoline or on a Rubik's yeah. Cube or uh, a CD or a soccer ball, you know. Oh, but then there's, like, the actual science-y ones, like engine coolant. That was cool because it's like you actually see, okay, huh, it works, and this is why engine coolant is a coolant versus something else. It's not boiling, it's just... Like cooling it. So I think there's science. Tim, what's that one that you watched where that guy like electrocutes himself like almost every episode to prove Oh that my god, Ahmed oh, like, I know what you're talking about. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he's the best. Oh my god, he's hysterical. Who is it? Med Med Medki Sally. Oh, yeah. Bidahar. Yeah, Medi, Sa Medi Sandar. Or, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but... I need to go to YouTube so I can see it spelled out. Yeah, yeah, wait, wait. I'm going to yeah. post... I just put... I'm going to post a link to it in the... Um, the uh, What's it called? just organized all of my stuff today. I was so proud. All my YouTube subscriptions are now organized, but I can't scroll. Hmm. Oh. He's so... He is so funny. I think the first time... Tim showed me a video of his was we were talking about whether water was conductive or not, and he does an experiment where he sticks like two ends of the wire in water and puts his hand closer and closer until he actually gets electrocuted. It's, it's a crazy, very unsafe channel. Yeah. He, he does teach like a lot about um, myths and stuff with electrical things. Which is kind of why he gets electrocuted. <laughs> well, at least he does it safely? Question yeah. mark. Kind of, but at least he does it so you don't have to, so you know what's right and wrong, I guess. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, he sort of knows he's going to shock himself by doing these yeah. things. So. Mm. So, here's the, here's the thing. Uh, as you guys know, I've been doing job with baby now. Maybe you don't. Now you do. I've been hunting for a job, and I got a job, and it's for a company that makes uh, DC inverters for solar systems. And it's the coolest thing in the world. Uh, because we have like these inverter structures, and we open them up, and I've never done like electrical engineering, and now I'm like, I feel like a wizard every time somebody calls in, and I'm like, hey, yeah, no, I can help you fix this amazing magical device that turns sunlight into electricity. It's the coolest thing. Science guys, whoa, awesome. let me tell you. I have one around here somewhere. I'm looking for it. <laughs> Sweet. I don't think I'll find it, though. Everything's in boxes. I, I can relate. Like, everything's in boxes. <laughs> so that's good. We have a, a Twitter question that said, what are top examples of art and STEM being mixed, and what are your thoughts on future projects? that can accomplish this mix? Um, Kinetic sculptures. Ooh. They're my favorite. Yes. yes. Or today Wind something... Oh, was, that, was that checking? What you sent me today was an example, too. The link? I forget what I sent you. The glasses? Oh, yeah, yeah. There was a there was a, a uh, advertisement from Balsamar, and it was basically they had developed a filter for lenses for their... For they looked like they were aviator sunglasses, but they were enabling colorblind people to see color by applying different filters to the, to the light that was coming in through it. So they were able to correct their color blindness. That is cool. That's awesome. That was the first time. It, was pretty, it was a pretty nice commercial. I actually watched it instead of clicking the skip ad button. 
<laughs> it went three minutes long, so. Nice. Um, I think it was like Valspar Color for All dot com. I think is what it was. Yeah, I think so. Art and science. So how do you guys think science and art um, can be kind of integrated well, together? Are we talking art or like for me, what I do is um, well, not so much in my um, yeah, I guess it's, I mean still um, I'm an audio engineer, so I kind of have to be a little bit um, conscious of both. Um, like, I have to know enough about the physics of sound to make, you know, make my um, recording sound good, and then from a, um, also from, like, a creative or just um, listener perspective, like, what sound, like, what's um, technically correct and what um, sounds good to people and how those two things come together with, be it music or, um, like, audiobooks. So um, that's one of the things I've always liked about what I do is that I kind of can do a little bit of science and a little bit of creative things too. So, yeah. Nice. I just bought an app, which is uh, I think going to be like the next big thing to revolutionize. I'm just kidding. It's not. It's uh, <laughs> it's just an app, but it's um, it's like two dollars. It's called Eye Ornament, and it's. Uh, it uses radial symmetry, so you just like doodle on it, but you can pick, well it's not just radial symmetry, it's like all the different types of symmetry that show up in nature, and then there's all this, if you actually like dig into like some of the folders underneath, it talks about all the math behind it and stuff, and um, some different like aspects of science where some of it comes from, and I haven't really fully like immersed in it because I just got it, but it's it's pretty cool, and, and I like it as both the intersection of science and art, but also it's one of those things where you can either like dabble with it just a little bit when you have a minute here and there, or you know, wait in line and it's someplace boring or whatever, uh, or you can like really like dive in and like do some deeper learning with it. So it's got that different levels of engagement. So I like it. Nice. So, as far as like the combination of art and science, I'm a big photography nerd, um, but I'm just a big nerd in general. It's just I happen to do a lot of photography, and I think one of the coolest things that science can do, like when you merge them, is if you can get somebody to, to be engaged with any kind of phenomenon. And for me, it's like the physics of light. I think that is just the coolest thing, like how light works and what it does when you see it and how it makes things pretty and like mm -hmm. I was thinking to myself the other day because I was driving home and it was sunset it was right around sunset it's like I wonder if somewhere there's a planet where the blue light doesn't get filtered out and at sunset everything turns blue instead of yellow like thinking about the science of all of these really aesthetically pleasing yeah. ideas to me that's where kind of like the, the art and science meet for me um, but Peter, you know who does that a lot? My husband, Ben Gilbert, because he's a game designer. And so maybe right, video games, games, I don't know why that wasn't my first answer, oh. but uh, maybe <laughs> video games is where there's the intersection of, of art and science because you are having to work with the constraints of the world we're used to being in because we have certain expectations we set up, but then you're like branching out and you have these other possibilities for the more artistic side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey Meg, that is so cool that your husband's a game designer. I'm yes. also, uh, one of the things I actually want to do while I'm here is I'm, I think I'm going to be joining a gaming lab, because I'm also super, in, I mean, I have a lot of different interests, I'm sure we all do, but one of them is um, examining how games can teach people things. And that's something that exists here at Penn State, which is really fortunate. Um, and it can be everything from, you know, if you play something like Portal 2 to work on puzzle solving, cognition, um, you could use a game like Bioshock to look at things like foreshadowing your story or even ethics. Um, and actually, so I don't know if you've heard, if you all have heard of the game Super Smash Bros, um, <laughs> but I love that game a ton. And I recently, it's interesting because it's super deep and most people are sort of casual players, but um, you can actually play the game competitively, which I've started doing recently. And it's super interesting because a lot of that game is coming down to 
just pattern recognition and then application of it. And there are a bunch of small things like, you know, levels of automaticity in performing advanced techniques in the game or just predicting what your opponent's about to do and then, you know, capitalizing on that. So that stuff is really interesting to me. Yeah, and there's, a, there's like the user interface thing, which I, is that, I don't know if that's art or science. I like to think maybe it's a little bit more art, but you have to be able to pick up on those things so that they're, they're subtle, right? You don't want to like beat somebody over the head but in any kind of interface that you're working with, not just with games, right? And I think as our technologies are advancing more and more, the, the philosophy behind how we interact with them is going to be maturing, and it's pretty cool. I think about that a lot with like I, um, iPhone apps because there are um, yeah. certain ones that I'm like, what are you like? What this doesn't make any sense to the way I want it. It just doesn't work the way I want it to. <laughs> like, can't there be a better way to do this? Because and I'm sure there are. Like people are I'm sure there are people working on those things. That would be an interesting thing to. Yeah, and sometimes there about. aren't. Like sometimes someone just wants to like bang something out and get it up into the store. Yeah. Like that's I mean, the decision makers are prioritizing those things, right? For right. Individual development company. Mm-hmm. One of the, the things one of my friends was talking about recently was augmented reality kind of stuff. Yeah. And there is he has like an Oculus Rift and there's mm-hmm. a Kickstarter out that somebody's doing the Apollo eleven mission. And they're trying to go like start to finish with it, so you're like a part of the mission, and you're pushing the buttons and stuff. I know that's that's kind of a push, is like taking you into these immersive places mm-hmm. to learn things you couldn't have learned otherwise. Mm-hmm. And he t- he told me about one that you can travel through the solar system, and everything's to scale, and you can kind of just like float around and really visualize it a lot better. So I think that's pretty cool. That's if that's gonna make its way into education. That's yeah, really immersion cool. and you know getting yeah. into that state of flow that you know cheek sent me high that state of flow all, all that stuff I think there's so much potential that we're like just now scratching the surface of. So speaking of augmented reality and the Apollo missions, I actually and uh, lesser known awesome educational channels. There's this gal named Amy Shira Title who is a yes. yeah space historian and she live tweeted the Apollo missions. Uh, not this December, but the December before, for like the the 40th or 50th anniversary. Yeah. And it was just the coolest thing, because like, you know, you'd go on your Twitter feed, or like, if you had updates going to your phone, it'd be like, mm-hmm. what? No way! We just entered orbit around the moon! This is the coolest thing! And, or like, you know, okay, we're touching down, and then she'd, you know, include things like pictures and videos and stuff like that, like archival footage. That, like, it's augmented reality in a way because it's using something that we we perceive reality through like Twitter or social media and then tweaking it and like is that not the coolest thing in the world mm-hmm. I think it is so yeah she's she's really cool Tim and I actually got to me- got to meet her um, nice. we invited her to come out to our robotics competition we mentor you know those robots that shoot like the frisbees and the basketballs and things Mm-hmm. Um, we mentor our high school team, so we asked her to come to one of those competitions, and I don't know if you've ever seen one, but it's pretty crazy. Like, Sweet. you would think people are just sitting there, you know, being calm. No, the kids are dressed in costumes, there's music mm-hmm. and dancing, and it's just, it's a ton of fun. So she came and wrote, like, a little article on it, and uh, she was only going to stay for, like, half an hour, but she had so much fun, she stayed the, the whole day. And she actually is coming out with a new book. It's on pre-order right now. And it's all about, like, the history of space flight. So you can find that on Amazon if you're like me and you're really into, like, space and the history of it. But her channel, yeah, is definitely pretty awesome. And I think sometimes she's on D-News, too. Mm -hmm. They blew up uh, a pumpkin pie for Thanksgiving. They made, like, a rocket motor pumpkin (laughs) pie kind of thing, and they lit it on fire and and blew it up. So... Yeah, she was, uh, so she used to live in South Carolina, or North Carolina, and I was going to meet up with her when I was passing through, but while I was in Europe, she kind of sort of moved, and so I had no idea, and so when I got back to the States, I I tweeted her, because we'd been tweeting before trying to arrange it, and I was like, hey, okay, I'm going to be passing through uh, North Carolina soon, Uh, what time works for you? And she's like, oh, bad news, I've moved to LA. I was like, (laughs) how perfect, I live in California. (laughs) So it's become one of those things that's like, 
once I have more money in my savings account, or if some random anonymous donor suddenly decides, oh, Peter's Patreon needs more money, uh, <laughs> I'm going to take a weekend and go down there and hit up her, um, a lady who has an art channel, Anthony D'Angelo, uh, the guy who does Thug Notes, which is another amazing channel that is not so small anymore, but he does literature in the best way. Because um, I think, yeah, that, yeah. She's so great. She's just the, the nicest person. So We had a question, but it went away because I think I got rid of the app. But um, <laughs> Nick, 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 if you want to repost your art question, it was about, I think it was Klaus Kemp. Is that right? Is that a good artist? Does that sound familiar? He had, <laughs> he had a, uh, a question. Oh, yeah, Klaus Kemp. He, he said that he really blended... Um, science and art together. Sorry, I lost your question somehow. Uh, it's I have... Yeah, <laughs> you know, Peter, I have Klaus Kemp is a really great combination of science and art, if you guys have heard of him. Um, he makes super amazing art out of diatoms. Oh, is that the... Is that the one that was on Tumblr? There's like these little tiny microorganism kind of things, or like bacteria, mm -hmm. and he finds them in water and he takes them out and he rearranges like these little microscopic organisms into these like giants, like I think like fractal looking things and colors them and it is really, really, really cool looking. It looks like his website, I could be wrong, but it looks like it's www.diatoms.co.uk. Nice. If anyone's interested. Diatoms.co.uk. There's some German dude who keeps sending tweets at me with all of these, <laughs> what an erg. Uh, but one of them is the uh, the Royal Institution, uh, which looks pretty sweet. So I guess it is uh, the Royal Institution of Great Britain explores the latest research and investigates key issues in science, technology, engineering, and maths. Uh, and then Nathan and Rose, I have heard of them. They're on my yes. list. They're super yeah. great. And who else is he calling out? Uh, Super Enzyme Justice League, uh, which he says is like a whiteboard edu kind of videos. So uh, that's cool. That is cool. Yeah. Hmm. Gonna add them to my database. My, uh, Do it. Gonna catch them all. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, something. For I guess for me, most of the more artistic things I've done um, have involved music, as I uh, sing and play piano. Um, but I don't really talk about that much on my channel just because it doesn't come up. Um, but with art and stuff, I did a, two videos on uh, color theory. And it's very easy, obviously, that that is that applies to art. Um, and I thought it was really fascinating because I just had no idea before that really how our eyes saw primary colors and how our eyes process things of that nature. Um, and I learned, about all, I learned a lot about color theory and things like processing complementary colors and what colors would work well with others and you know if you're there's subtractive light mixing and there's additive light mixing and I thought that was all pretty cool. I was in a um, with a choir I was in an episode of Radio Lab on colors that um, they explored the um, color spectrum like with um, using the choir to represent um, different like I guess it's frequency uh, frequencies um, uh, Infrared, uh, I don't remember. I don't remember. Yes, thank you. <laughs> well, yeah, yes, wavelength is the right word. Things I should know. Um, <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> as an Friday. audio person. Um, but, um, yeah, so the, uh, we used different groups of singers to represent um, different wavelengths, different, you know, groups of colors and, like, what different animals can see and, uh, um, you know, so by the time we get the mantis shrimp is has like the biggest range of color. Yes, craziness. So we had everyone in this like two, oh, probably like a hundred, over a hundred people in this choir singing mantis shrimp. And um, there's a video of that somewhere. I'll have to find it and uh, post it. But that was that was one of the cooler things I've done in New York. That's awesome. Yeah, it was really fun. It's really cool when people do stuff like that because uh, somebody did. Well, people are doing this all the time. Where like they'll take the the radio wave or the wavelengths of anything from space and then turning it into 
like auditory information and then playing that and like seeing how people react to that, like the patterns that like binary stars mm -hmm. create, or like you know taking the the mathematical information from an orbit uh, and converting it into noise is just yeah. is cool. It's really cool. So, yeah, it's yeah. really cool. And we even have a simple form of it going on with the robot we have drawing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And Betty, um, in her video that she sent out, and I'll have to put a link at the bottom of the, this Hangout. I don't know if you guys watched it, but yeah. we, we met at the um, thing that Destin was putting on, and they were, all, they were all education science YouTubers there, and when she would be like, I have an art channel, people would be like, why are you here? So I think it, it kind of speaks to the fact that sometimes people think that they're separate things, but I think you kind of need both of them together. You need science and art. Um, because art kind of usually makes things better, I think. Science is sometimes more functional, and then you need the art part to make it a little bit better. Like we were talking about games and things. And we well, have it's part of the human experience, right? Like yeah, you need yeah. both sort of sides of the human experience. Yeah. I think a more appealing might be a better maybe a yeah. better way of putting that or like more appealing or um yeah, along those lines like um getting people interested from a different perspective. Um and the why, I think, is a lot of that too, like there's science provides functionality, but the knowing why and how it uh, relates to you is, um, yeah, kind of a place that art can come in. And yeah. 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 Well, provide that like, experience. So. <laughs> exactly. Like the cool thing about science uh, is, and art, like really, we can look at them separately. But if you look at they, they a lot of uh, words. A lot of times, Word of you, okay. they give you the same thing. Like you get, for at least for me, you know, I get a sense of wonder when I look at something that's just beautiful or something that like moves me. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with science, and they're very complementary. Like if I look at, for example, a kinetic sculpture, sculpture that's just like beautifully narrowly balancing on this tiny precipice, and it's this huge piece of metal, and this wind comes in, just gentlest breeze, and suddenly the thing starts spinning. It's like what? And then, you know, looking at, I don't know, a cell, something super small, super simple, but so incredibly complex, like, I, I imagine there are a lot of people out there who have that, that sense of wonder, and I am just, every day, just blown away by everything. I am, it's just the best thing, and so, like, it's really not that hard to mix the two, and I think people should try more. I think the yeah. golden ratio is another good example of that intersection. I was thinking of that too, Meg. Yeah. yeah. And I, one of my favorite Tumblr um, vlog or blogs to follow is like scientific illustrations. Um, they are some of the most beautiful pictures that were ever done. And before we had photography and stuff, that's what that's how other people learn. That's how you communicated with these like really intricate, beautiful, wonderful drawings that people did to share their what they saw or things they were inventing and it, it's really it's really cool to look at. Um, Jacqueline, we were talking about Reddit earlier. If you go mm -hmm. to the subreddit Woe Dude, Woe spelled it incorrectly, W O A H okay. and then D U D E. Um, they have a lot of a lot of things are GIFs, some things are just pictures, but a lot of the GIFs are um, I guess a sort of mesmerizing trippy thing, but they all have this, you know, they're all inherently art. Mm -hmm. And like you were talking about how people did music with the planets, I don't know, have you guys ever heard people are actually making music for animals? Because we were saying how they, they see differently, but animals hear differently. No, that's, so people, that's beautiful. People are actually, People are actually doing studies because you know mm -hmm. cats and dogs make different noises with their with their vocal cords and they hear differently. So they're making music that's more tuned to them that they find as music. We don't find that as music, and they don't find our things right. as music. So it's kind of it's kind of interesting that they're they're doing that for different animals. I think they started with monkeys because they were kind of similar to us, and now they're they have dogs and cat music. Ooh, nice.
pretty cool because, like, uh, when you think about, like, it seems to us maybe that, uh, you know, the idea of aesthetic is a distinctly human idea, but how can we really be sure? Like, I mean, what is aesthetic? If a dog likes the way something looks, a dog's going to like the way it looks. Maybe there's some, like, biological motivator, but it becomes a matter of preference either way. Um, and so to try and tailor that to other animals is really cool. So, yeah. It's pretty sweet. Everything's really cool. I'm just a, I'm a big old <laughs> child and I can't stop being excited by everything. Yes. Uh, I think some German guy asked us a bunch of questions in the... Oh, yeah. Oh, so yeah. yeah. The, like, if you go to our video, I'm um, like on the other computer. I was seeing uh, that too. Okay, one thing. Okay, so he is saying one. Uh, science and art have so much in common. Most art forms of science at their core and scientific knowledge only make you uh, better at your craft. As someone with a filmmaking background, I need at least some understanding of the physics of light and mm -hmm. sound, plus chemistry back in the go. day and technology. Painters and sculptors profit from knowing the materials they use and so on. And the people in art and science are similar in many ways. The, mm -hmm. the passion, the love for what they do, etc. Uh, they also face similar problems and fears, getting funding and grants, uncertain future as projects come to an end. Um, in short, science and art should totally be friends. <laughs> I totally agree. <laughs> yep, yep. And he, he had left that comment before, and I had said, I, I didn't realize, it's so true, though, about the same fears of... Um, both sides have to kind of convince you that it's worth it. The yeah. art's worth it, or whatever you're studying is worth yeah. it. It's kind of, kind of weird. But, I mean, that's why we have awesome people who do science communication, uh, like you guys, you know, putting it out there and showing, like, oh, there's, you know, yes, there's practical applications to science. Every application to science is practical. But... It can also be really cool, so let's watch this robot draw as we send messages mm -hmm. to it over this weird, magical, wireless thing called the Internet. Oops. I just pulled out my earbud. Um, huh. But yeah, like, hella, as they say in California. <laughs> Lily cover your ears. So, Peter, what do you think is the biggest thing you've learned through all your, your interviews? Uh, uh, I would say that, well, I don't know, like, um, one thing that, it's not so much that I learned, but it was affirmed, is that everybody cares so much, uh, which is awesome. Uh, another thing is that, like I mentioned, like, every, just about everybody has a team, it's not just one person, which is good, because it's healthy, and it's really hard to be sustainable when it's just one person. Um, and whether or not that team is in person or over the interwebs generally doesn't make too much of a difference. Um, um, everybody has different reasons. It's not always that like they just want to go and put forth the message. Uh, some people have really practical reasons for wanting to do education online, like wanting to do a, an educational YouTube channel. Lindsay is a great example. She has a daughter. She wanted a stable source of income. Boom. There you go. It was. It just happened that she was filling a need as well as filling her own need um, for having an income by providing sex ed to everyone. So, lots of stuff, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, to bounce off that question, what do you feel? This is to everyone. What do you feel is probably the biggest thing or biggest couple of things you've learned from YouTube? and what you've done with it so far. Do you want to jump at once? Um, I think, well, I think for me, just the um, the amount of people you ha can reach can, should you be able to, let, you know, get noticed and get stuff out there, like, um, and just, I don't know, the different ways people are presenting things. Like, I love Crash Course. I think, um, I don't, there's the way they they're so entertaining and um, like they're just goofy. I like that. Um, I think that's with a lot of YouTube. Like I didn't really, I just kind of realized that this whole like educational and vlogging thing was here like within the past year, and I'm like, oh, this is a thing. I like this. Thing. <laughs> and um, but yeah, just being able to connect with people 
um, that you feel like um, are kind of like you, you know? Because um, you don't always find that in other in other media or necessarily in real life. I mean, if you're lucky, you get to, you know, you have good friends and all that stuff. But um, I don't, I think um, it's cool to be able to see different perspectives and um, that everybody has access to all kinds of educational content and, and the ability to make it if they want to. With not too, you know, and it's not like um, prohibitively expensive to, to do this kind of stuff. Yeah. I think the same kind of thing, just meeting people I wouldn't have met otherwise, like mm -hmm. all you guys. Yeah. Um, being able to talk to you guys either here or on Twitter or other people in the YouTube comments. Because I watched videos for a long time, but it's only recently that I started commenting in stuff, and that's been pretty cool to yeah. just be able to talk about all kinds of stuff um, with people that I care about um, besides just science, but mainly education stuff is a, a really, really big thing. So I've really enjoyed the community aspect, especially mm -hmm. things like Project for Awesome. That's yeah. one of my absolute favorite times of year that you get to watch videos of people that are going around the world and just doing things for charity, like in their everyday mm -hmm. life, whether it was because somebody in their family had something wrong, or they just, this is what they believe in. Mm -hmm. And you get hundreds of people tell their stories. And then we all just, from around the world, join together, and we're like, yes, we're going to listen to this, we're going to vote, we're going to raise money. Right. And just the magnitude of what you can do when you kind of build a, a community behind things. Mm -hmm. And it's not science related, but there's, um, I like a uh, channel Shipwreck Comedy. It's more um, like short films and things like that. Mm -hmm. And just the art and how people interact with that has been amazing to watch too. They do like head cannons, so they do shorter snippets and you can write fanfic and it kind of gets put in, kind of like Lizzie Bennet Diaries. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Yeah. I think just the epicness of um, the internet community that is based around YouTube, even if you talk in Twitter or Tumblr. It all starts with a, a certain video or a certain topic that somebody found and decided they wanted to talk about, and then all these other people come around it. So more than like the gaming stuff and whatnot. So that's, that's why I've liked it. And I think this echoes what both of you have just said, but I think I've, what I've learned the most is about the, the power of a low barrier to entry. Mm -hmm. So, like, while making videos isn't free, it's a lot cheaper than video production was before there was YouTube. Yeah. So that's, you know, and I think a lot of people sort of reiterate that again and again, but that's, that's what really stands out to me. Yeah, I'm going to tag on to what Jacqueline said in that... Um, Definitely the biggest thing I've learned was just how um, vast a potential YouTube and really the internet um, have in general for reaching out to people and just communicating um, barrierlessly without borders or barriers. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, it's, it's really, really cool just that it is, in a certain sense, so easy to make something and then have people see it and share it or comment or whatever. Um, and, you know, I talked about how I realized the YouTube channel would be, that's how I realized I could share the ideas I loved, getting started with YouTube. What I didn't mention was before that, um, I was under the impression that YouTube was a place for viral videos that your friends would send you and nothing more, that there weren't, you know, creators who consistently <laughs> put out content under a single yeah. theme. Um, and then one day my friend actually sends me a video from this creator called the Vlog Brothers, <laughs> and I watch it, yep. and I, it's nice, yeah. But I, I, and then I explore the channel, and I'm going, oh my god, wait, they have tons of videos like this. Uh -huh. It's like yeah. it's like they're making them with a plan or something. Uh, yeah. And so that was the first time I genuinely realized that you could do that, and mm -hmm. that changed yeah. my perspective on things. And so it was actually the Vlog Brothers really who inspired me to start uh, a YouTube channel. Me too. It's <laughs> awesome. Uh, I would say one thing that I learned from YouTube is how very human everyone is. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, like, cause, so you see somebody like Hank Green or John Green or Lindsay Doe or Micro Brunetta, like all of yeah. these people who in your brain are kind of like, you know, you see them on YouTube and the relationship is very one, one-sided. Um, or you see somebody like Meg who like, you know, now that I met you in person, I know 
there you are a different person in person than you are mm -hmm. on YouTube. And like much less articulate, by the way. <laughs> much more articulate. Much more hilarious. Um, and like but just seeing how like people are more than just these these faces mm -hmm. put on the screens, that's awesome. And I don't know why I didn't expect it, but I didn't. And yeah, so just wow. kind of that's how basically every single person I've met so far has been is just amazing. So <laughs> yeah, Peter, I was yeah. when I um I, I talked a couple times about my friend Jack, whom I'm going to meet up in uh, VidCon. But we we also did a collab video, so we did a Skype call, and and we got along really well. I'd consider him a really good friend, um, and we've talked since then. But um, at some point, probably something like I don't know. A little while into our conversation, he said to me, we just started talking about you know I don't know, YouTube, and he said something like, um, you know Matt, you're a pretty cool person, and you know I figured that from your YouTube channel, but you never really know until you talk to them like not offline. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. And it's weird because like after seeing like that happen so many times, it really got kind of got me like uh, looking at how I make my own videos and like. How I do the intro and outro for all of my videos, I always waffle between like, ah, I'm gonna script it so that I actually have a coherent train of thought and sound unnatural mm -hmm. to myself, or am I going to like just off the cuff talk about this person, and uh, you know, as I would talking to you guys like this, yeah. and every single time for like every single video, it's always a different thing, and I feel it's one of the biggest, honestly, one of the biggest things that causes me delays in releasing <laughs> videos is that intro and outro, because I get so self-conscious and like try and make it work, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, I've, I've thought about that sometimes. I don't, I don't really have, my format isn't the same, so um, I don't really have an intro. Mm -hmm. um, but most of the, the vast majority of stuff I do, I don't script because if I did script it, I would realize that one, when I'm in front of the camera, I'll think of something better to say anyway, and scripting just takes a lot of work. Um, but especially with the outros, I usually just say something like, um, okay, that's it, thanks for watching, um, and then whatever else I'm thinking, because <laughs> I feel like there's nothing else to say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have a hard time, well, so far I've had a hard time with scripted videos as opposed to <laughs> doing um, just kind of writing down ideas and then talking because there's like there's like a different preparation in my brain that, that has to have to, like I have to memorize I would have to memorize the script to a certain degree whereas if I kind of just write down ideas and then go from a, you know I'll go from notes a little bit it's it's a lot I can it flows a lot better yeah yeah that flow though that is like yeah that's what gets me like, and I, because I'm really proud of my ability to write. You know, not to brag or anything, but right. I'm a great writer. Uh, <laughs> but then, <laughs> when I have to read it out loud, things it's get a little hard. crazy. Because like, yeah, how how you talk and how you how you talk and how you write are totally different. Totally and so different. the flow doesn't it doesn't translate. And then, yeah, so I, I have yeah. that problem. <laughs> totally I'm the opposite to you, Peter. I'm a much better speaker than I am a writer. Um, but I, I'm definitely getting better as a writer. But I was I was a terrible one um, throughout high school, and it wasn't until I sort of the transition period into college when I just started reading more, and that really helped. Mm -hmm. um, but I've always been a way better speaker than I am a writer. Oh yeah, no, I'm totally out. <laughs> I've always been a better writer than than speaker. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. I feel like so there's someone in the question fan two four or probably fan twenty four drr. Yeah, it's David. Hello, David. Hey, David. How you doing? If you're still there. Sorry, that was weird. I'll stop doing that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just meant because he asked the question a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> that was like yeah. a weird yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. I was I was like, a while ago. And I was looking at it, and I'm thinking, wow, we should have addressed this. I feel really bad. <laughs> yeah, I haven't looked at that question thing in a while. So. Yeah, so he, he just kind of mentioned how, uh, like, aircrafts, the aesthetic of aircrafts and aerodynamicness are a thing, uh, and how like they're almost artistic because of how how they're shaped. Mm. And I I totally agree personally. I think like yeah, it's one of those terrible things. Like uh, my friend is Australian and lives in Wisconsin and is a pilot. And we went to an air show one time and we were looking at all these planes that were lined up 
and I see like an F-17 or an F-16 or like an F-35, you know, warplanes look really sexy. <laughs> but then his, his reply was like, they're designed to kill people. And I'm like, oh, oh yeah, that's a good point. So, like, yeah. I don't know if that's related, but it came into my brain, so I thought I'd share. So what, this is a random question, like, what led you guys, not necessarily to YouTube, but, like, the paths that you took um, to get you where you are now in music or education? Um, I knew I wanted to be in music from the time I was uh, 12 or younger, I think. Um, I switched schools. I switched from private school to public school in, like, sixth grade, I think, and then um, I joined the, a chorus. It, or well, a bunch of choruses, but I joined chorus, and then I joined, like, people realized that I could sing, I realized that I could sing, and, um, yeah, that was just it. I just knew that that's what I wanted to do, and then my parents didn't want me to go to college for performance, <laughs> and, um, and I was totally the person who would, like, take apart, I, I took apart a CD player at some point when I was in high school, I think. Just to try to figure out how it works. And I was like, this uh, sound engineering thing would be good for you. And um, so yeah, so I went to um, I have a degree in uh, a bachelor of music in sound engineering. And um, I worked in radio for a couple of years, and now I'm doing audiobooks. And you know, singing. And I actually I started writing songs I think somewhere around when I was 21, and I've been doing that on and off since then. So yeah. And YouTube, I just started within the past, like, six months or so, so, still learning. <laughs> but it's been fun so far. Um, I guess I can go. So, uh, so I'm really passionate about, passionate about sharing the ideas I love. Um, I, I guess I don't fully, really, I guess just there are certain ideas that I think are so, so cool. I just want to share them with others because I, I wind up thinking something like, how can anyone not think this is cool? Um, and I guess some of the ideas I really, really love are psychology, I probably because just the fact that we can be influenced in so many ways we don't understand is fascinating because we we aren't aware of it. And I... I had never assumed that you know things could be that deep before I read a book written by a uh, professor of psychology at, from Duke named Dan Ariely. Um And then I guess education because I, as I did stuff like YouTube and you know reading the psychology books, I realized that um, I learned really well independently, or well not yeah independently, but I learned really well in ways that aren't traditional school. Um, and so I guess. I'm really interested in sharing that experience, the experiences I've had where I felt like I've had the best learning with other people, sharing them in the sense that maybe I could try to design something that would benefit other people. So that's me. I guess on my side. So I, I, oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, I guess okay, you can go. Uh, I started doing YouTube because I was like really bored as a stay-at-home mom. So, I, am I the only one with kids on this panel? I think so. I have a brother. A kid. <laughs> 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 so, being a parent of a very small and young child is is probably the most isolating experience I've ever had, like in my adulthood. So. Um, and it's just, just inherent in our culture. It's just built into our culture. So, and also we had uh, moved um, when my baby was really, really little, so I didn't have like a social structure, yeah. in, you know, any kind of like connections to the community locally or anything like that. So, you know, I would just start making videos and stuff when, when they would take her naps because it gave me a creative outlet and also like a social connection. And so that's been my motivation. If I had a full time, like when I was working full time, there's no way I would have the time or energy or wherewithal to then come home and make videos. Yeah, like right. <laughs> really good. Sir. So those of you who do it, I, I commend you because... That's been you, my struggle so that's far. That's you can actually draw energy from because I, my batteries would be so like... Dip, 
created from, you know, but you know, not all of my work was that applied. <laughs> Um, I know we're all sort of in the middle of answering questions, but I believe at this point I yeah. should get going. Yeah. Um, yeah, we so, can wrap it up because it's been it's been a good bit. We can always do another hangout later. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. We definitely should do that. Also, I was thinking while we're while we're all here, uh, can we just kind of agree that we're going to do a meetup at VidCon? Yes, 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 definitely. Definitely. Cool, cool. So let's do that, and then we'll do another one after VidCon in up in, by San Jose, so Meg can come. It'll be great. <laughs> we cannot go to the beach. Ooh. Is anyone staying in California after VidCon ends? Yeah, I, I live here. Well, yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I think I'm going to try to stay for Disney Day, but not beyond that, so. Yeah, probably the same. Okay. I'm not a fan of amusement park rides, so I'm probably just, I'm just going to, I'm planning on going home right after VidCon, actually. Oh. Nice. It's whatever. Um, yeah. but thank you guys so much for coming on the hangout and talking and we can definitely do more hangouts and I'm sure we'll keep in touch uh, via yeah, Twitter thanks. and YouTube yes thanks so much for having me I'm yeah excited. thanks thanks for setting yeah, us up yeah thanks for organizing yeah. this Jacqueline this yeah, is the best no thing problem. ever <laughs> <laughs> and if you guys are going to do hangouts you can, you can ask me questions about how to how to set it up I, I helped uh, Matt out some I have a Screenshot of everything I did today. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if very you informative. Want that document, I'll, I'll send it to you. Very cool. Very cool. Oh, gonna... I'm gonna do a hangout on April 9th. Uh, that's about drawing mandalas. It's for the art assignment. So nice. you can, I'll tweet you. And yes. uh, if you're available and interested, I'd love to have you. Oh, nice. Cool. Hey. I'm I'm doing one tomorrow apparently. Uh, uh, apparently. Paul Iden, Paul talks. He, he does a lot of social stuff. Meg knows him, uh, but yeah. he's doing one for his one year anniversary, I think, tomorrow. And he was like, "Hey, Peter, come do the hangout tomorrow." I was like, "All right, it's Saturday. <laughs> I'll I'll have slept by then, I'm sure." So. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, so definitely meet up at VidCon. We all have each other's. Yes. I mean, we're on Twitter, so yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Cool. yeah. Everybody that's watching still, um, if you're going to VidCon, tweet us. Let us know, and we'll definitely try and meet up with yeah, you guys, too. Please. Yes, <laughs> please. <laughs> yes, love to interact. Talking about engaging audiences right there, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you guys so much. Have a great rest of your weekend. Awesome. Thanks. You too, Jacqueline. Bye. Ciao. Nice meeting you, everyone. Bye.